transition to residential care. And that's me, after me yapping for all this while. Uh, Jan Robson, I'm the Provincial Education Coordinator at the Alzheimer's Society of BC. I do the teleworkshops and do lots of workshops in person and also through a webinar format for healthcare providers. So the overview today, and I do want to stress that today's workshop really is a thumbnail sketch. Um, the workshop that it's based on, our in-person workshop, um, would typically take two, two and a half hours to go through. So this really is touching the important factors involved in considering a transition to residential care for a family member. I would encourage you, if you are in a community that has uh, a resource center, Alzheimer's Society Resource Center, to check out when they are offering their transition to residential care workshop in person. Um, there's a lot of communities that don't actually have a resource center based in the community, but a local resource center in the general area will go in and do workshops. So, so do check, and if you don't know, um, if you do have a resource center or where it would be, how to contact them, we'll have contact information at the end for the dementia helpline that can put you in touch with the resource centers. It really is good to be able to sit down with other people and, and talk about this in person if you are able to. So today is just an overview. So we'll be looking at options for residential care, what types of facilities are out there, how do you get to them, you know, how, how do you have uh, gain access to residential care facilities, how do you apply, what are the criteria, what is the cost, that's always the, the big question. How do you qualify, who qualifies? for subsidized care, because certainly there is private pay and there is also subsidized. How can you qualify for the subsidized? When is it time to look at this transition? And that's the million dollar question for, for so many people. How will I know when it's time for my husband, my mom, my dad? Um, how, will I, how will I know? And we'll talk about that a bit. And making the decision. What are some of the factors that um, go into making the decision, what are some of the factors that make it so, so difficult a decision to make? How do you choose a facility? And then what can you do to plan for the move to at least minimize some of the stress and, and really anguish that can go into making this move? So options. Um, several different possibilities when you're looking at residential care. And working with a case manager through home health, through the, the um, various health authorities, that's your best bet, is to work with a case manager to explore some of the options in your area. Now, some of you may be very early in the journey um, with your family member. Some of you may be actually getting to that decision point. If you are actually getting to the decision point, it's very possible you already are connected with a case manager. If you're not, the case manager is available through your local home and community care unit. So that's a, um, a division of the uh, health authority. And you would call and explain the situation, and they will have a, what's called a case manager come out and check out your situation. And what typically happens is the, the move to residential care isn't considered until there have been some community options tried. So that will be home support, home care, that kind of thing. So that's typically what they look at. But the case manager really is the gatekeeper for this process. So you would work with your case manager to look at potentially assisted living, residential care, family care homes, group homes, transitional care units. So there are several different options, and we'll look at each one briefly. So first of all, assisted living. Now, assisted living includes several things in, in, the, in the cost. One is the meals. Um, social and recreational programs, and they vary in the, the variety of programs they offer. Some of them are amazing, the amount of activities that are involved. They provide laundry, housekeeping. So for example, someone would probably come in typically about once a week, change the bed, um, clean the, the unit, that kind of thing. There's usually a 24-hour emergency response system, so if anything happens, you fall, that kind of thing. 
uh, someone would be available. Personal care assistance is available, helping with a bath, that kind of thing. The, the sticker, sticker for assisted living, though, is that the person must be able to make decisions for themselves. So they must be able to be sufficiently um, aware. Their, their cognitive faculties must be sufficiently intact that they can make decisions on their own. Um, certainly with assistance is OK, but they're able to make decisions. And they look at things like, for example, if a fire alarm went off, would they make that connection that the, the fire alarm's gone off, I have to get out? You know, are they able to still handle those kinds of situations? Are their cognitive faculties such that that would be a real difficult thing for them? Um, the, whole, the criteria for assisted living are, are in flux at this point. Um, there was a time when people would have often significant dementia in assisted living as long as they had a spouse with them who was able to make those decisions. That started to change a bit because what would happen often is something would happen to the well spouse. And then the assisted living facility was left with a person that they were not able to provide sufficient care for. And so that resulted in some difficult situations for them. And then gradually what's been happening recently is more and more people in assisted living have some degree of cognitive impairment. And they're looking at trying to somewhat change the criteria for admission. Um, because people were running into a situation where they were either eligible for assisted living because they weren't too bad in terms of cognitive functioning, or if they weren't eligible, the only other option was residential care. There, there weren't sort of in-between options for them. So assisted living is, is in, in flux at this point. The residential care facilities are geared towards people with complex care needs. And so they include 24-hour nursing care and supervision, meals again, assistance with medication, activities of daily living, social and recreational activities. So there's that much more intense involvement from staff towards the resident when it's the residential care and, and the nursing component as well. Some communities have what are called family care homes, and they support up to two clients in a single family residence. So basically, um, a family will, will have up to two people with um, care needs, and that could include dementia, living with them. And that can be an alternative to a care facility for some individuals in, again, some communities. They're, they're not everywhere. It can provide a more individualized approach to care, which is, is certainly um, appealing for families when you think of, you know, there's going to, they're going to be living in a small family-oriented type situation as opposed to an institutional kind of arrangement. And sometimes family care homes will provide short-term care upon leaving hospitals. So they can be used as a short-term option as opposed to the long-term option. So this is something, again, to check with the case manager to see if it's a, an option in your community if you're interested. Group homes take that step up, and they provide support for four to six residents. They might be operated by nonprofit societies. They provide short and long-term living arrangements, so it could be that transitional care coming out of hospital, um, or long-term um, the person is, is living out their life in this, in this home. The homes range from single-family dwellings to apartment complexes, and again, check with the case manager because there is a, a variability in terms of what's available in different communities. Transitional care. Transitional care offers transition and subacute beds. It's an alternative to hospital care. And so often what will happen if a person has been in hospital and they aren't able to go back home, and that could be uh, because of various care needs, not just the dementia, um, but they are waiting for residential care. And the hospital itself is really not geared to having a person over an extended period of time. And they don't really need the hospital care, uh, but they can't go home. So it's that, uh, that spot in the middle. Now licensing. It's important to know that, uh, that there is oversight 
for these facilities. Residential care facilities for three or more people are covered under the Community Care Facility Licensing Act and residential care regulations. And you can certainly look these acts up. They are online. So if you have a family member that goes into uh, different kinds of care and you have concerns, by all means, do, do check the legislation to see what people are bound by. Um, because there, there is that oversight. They do have regulations that they have to follow and an act that they are governed by. And so it's worth becoming somewhat familiar with it, at least over time. It's probably not the sort of thing you're going to bone up on when you're in, in the process of looking to have a family member go into care. But over time, especially if you're experiencing any problems, it's worth checking. Now, the way placement works in BC, it, it's operated under what's called priority access. It's a priority access system. So basically what this means is the person with the greatest need gets the first available bed. So you could potentially have um, your mother who has Alzheimer's disease and a heart problem, for example, and your friend's mother who has Alzheimer's disease and a heart problem. And they are both pretty much equal in, in terms of um, their heart problems. But your mother's dementia is significantly more uh, advanced than your friend's. Now, even if your friend had placed your, her mother on a wait list before you did, your mother would get priority because um, oh, I'm just uh, da, 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 enable video. OK, sorry, I, I had my um, cursor over something that wasn't supposed to be over. So yeah, the, it, it wouldn't just rely on whose name was on the wait list the longest. It would be based on which of these two women needs care the most. Where is it most urgent? And, and so to a, a certain degree, that's, that's nice. Because you know then you don't have to feel that if things take a, a turn for the worse fairly suddenly, um, you don't need to worry that, oh no, you know, we, we, we haven't picked a place out, we don't have our name on a wait list, it's going to be ages. Um, if things have gotten quite bad quite quickly, your family member will have priority over someone who is doing better. So that's, that's the good part about the priority access system. The downside, at least for a lot of people for the priority access system, is that you have to take the first available bed. That might not be in a place that you would prefer. So um, typically, we would, we would encourage people, if they're looking at the possibility of care coming up, to check out some of the facilities in your area. See which ones you like. And we'll talk about that a little bit farther on in this teleworkshop. Um, and, and get a sense of which are your top three. You know, Which would be the one you would prefer? Um, what would be a good alternative? And let the case manager know that. The case manager will do an assessment in terms of uh, determining priority access. But let the case manager know, you know, we've checked out five facilities, and facility X is the one we would really like mom to be able to go to. And they will try to accommodate that. I mean, they, they, they want the greatest degree of success for the people they're working with, just as you want uh, your family member to be happy. Um, however, again, the, the nature of the beast, if it's really necessary that, uh, that the person be placed, it's really the needs are great. And there isn't a bed in facility X, but there is a bed in facility Y, you have to take that bed in facility Y. Now, after 30 days, you are able to put your name on a wait list or your family member's name on a wait list for your preferred facility. So they ask that you wait 30 days because sometimes what happens is Facility Y was not your preferred facility for your family member. But they go into Facility Y because that's the first available bed. And they're doing well. They've adjusted. They're calm. You discovered that the staff at Facility Y are, are wonderful. It's not as nice a facility as Facility X. And that was one of the things that you liked about Facility X. It was new and fresh looking. But there's a warmth and, and real caring in facility Y that you really hadn't um, recognized at first. 
And so you may decide after 30 days, you know, I'm, I'm not going to move mom. This is good. Uh, she's happy here. But if after 30 days your family member's not doing great, you're still not happy about this being the choice, then you can get your name on a wait list for Facility X. So it's, um, and again, it's a wait list, so it may happen quickly, it may not happen quickly, but at least you can get your name on a list. Um, people can be transitioned from either home or hospital. Often when they're being transitioned from hospital, they get a little bump in terms of, uh, of priority. Um, but it, again, according to need. So how much does it cost? Well, there's, there's two routes that you can access residential care through. One is privately. So private care, if you go the private route, you don't need the case manager, although the case manager can still give you a list of care facilities, private pay care facilities in your area. Um, you contact the facility, you check it out, you like it, you put your name on a list, and it's a strict, it's not strict, but I mean it's strictly a wait list kind of thing. It's not a priority access system. You want this particular facility, you put your name on the list, your family member's name on the list, and when the name comes up, they can go in. Cost, the resident pays the full cost of nursing and personal care in private care. And so those costs can vary from facility to facility. So generally, you're, it depends a lot on community, which community. It can be anywhere from probably $2,000 a month to $10,000 a month. Um, but do keep in mind that when you're looking at the at private care versus subsidized care, often people feel that, you know, if you are paying everything yourself, if you're going the private pay route, the care must be so much better. And that's not necessarily the case. There are wonderful private pay facilities and there are wonderful subsidized facilities. There are not so wonderful of both types of facilities as well. So it's simply a different route to care. It's not qualitatively a better route or a worse route than, than going through subsidized. Now subsidized care, the health authority funds the cost of nursing and personal care instead of you putting the bill for that or your family. The resident might be expected to contribute to food and accommodation, but it's based on their annual income. So, um, and based on the annual income plus the resident gets to keep a minimum of $325 a month for other expenses. So for the sake of argument, if your family member's um, monthly income was um, $800, and that's a pension, for example, or um, old age pension, whatever. Now, they get to keep $325 a month for expenses, so what they would pay for their, their monthly um, contribution to care in subsidized care would be $675. That's the balance of their $800. They bring in $800, $325 is taken out for their personal expenses, and then the $675 goes towards um, contributing to the subsidized care. So it's a, it's a forgiving system to the extent that um, it's based on your income and you still have some money left over. And, and important to know it's based on income. So it's not based on what you own, unless what you own generates income. Um, so they will look at last year's income tax return. Now other expenses that, that you would have to pay for that would fall under that 325 include things like personal hygiene and grooming products, medication that isn't already covered by Pharmacare or um, if you don't already have a plan, telephone, cable, internet, dental care, eye care, foot care, ambulance service, those kinds of things um, would not typically be covered under the, the subsidized care. That would come out of the money that you get to keep at the end of the month. Also not covered would be things like ID bracelets, for example, medical alert bracelets, uh, personal insurance, physician charges if, if there are specialized physicians that, that are charging over and above um, what Medicare pays, um, and daily fees for preferred accommodations. So um, if the only room available in the facility is um, a private room and you're waiting for a subsidized room, you would have to pay extra for that until the subsidized room came available. 
Dry cleaning is also an expense that wouldn't be covered. Hair care, outings, social events, special therapies, and, and personal health care aids, wheelchairs, walkers, that kind of thing. Although a lot of facilities do have um, some of, and probably all of them, have um, walkers and wheelchairs that, that people can use. But if you want your own, you would be paying for it extra. Now, to be eligible for subsidized care, the person with dementia must have, and this is a quote from the regulations, complex care needs that cannot adequately be met in their home or in a supportive living environment. And so this is where I mentioned that the case manager will probably look at, you know, has there been home care already um, supplied to the person and they just can't get enough home care to enable them to, to remain at home. So there, there's, there comes a tipping point where, you know, there's home care, there's home care, and, and you know what? We can't put any more home care in. It's time to look at residential. The person must be over 19 years of age. They must meet BC and Canadian residence requirements. And they have to agree to the assessment process, including the provision of financial information, which some people have a hard time with. You know, here's my income tax return. But that's essential to qualify for subsidized care. Other income sources that, uh, that they would look at would be things like the guaranteed income supplement, um, allowance survivor benefits, that kind of thing, the BC income assistance for seniors, BC senior supplement, if there's any veterans benefits, and there are residential care facilities that are specifically targeted to, to veterans. They're, they're subsidized by Veterans Affairs. You can get more details on this from Seniors BC, so seniorsbc.ca or by all means call the Alzheimer's Society, either the Dementia Helpline or your local resource center, and they'll be able to give you more information about this. So making the decision for residential care. What makes the decisions about residential care so difficult? And anybody listening in on the phone, if, if you were to chime in right at this point, could probably throw in lots of possibilities. Um, first of all, deciding when the right time is. Um, I used to be the coordinator of the Dementia Helpline for several years, and that was probably the biggest question when people were thinking that this is maybe something they should look at. They would say, how do I know it's the right time? And what seems like a totally useless response, and it's really the only response to give, is you'll know. Um, it's a very individual decision. The right time for one family is probably not going to be the right time for another family. So for example, if you have a situation where um, it's a couple, the husband has dementia, getting to the point that the wife can no longer cope on her own, there's no family in the community, perhaps no family, period. Um, she has health issues of her own. She's quite frail. It's very possible that this man will go into residential care sooner than the other couple. And the other couple, the husband has dementia. The wife is the caregiver. They have three adult children that live in the area that provide regular respite for their mom. Um, the wife is in good health, she's strong, she, she has no um, chronic health conditions. They've had, over the years, a good, solid relationship. So she has that um, emotional bank account that allows her to weather some of the difficulties that she'll experience as a caregiver. Very likely that this man will stay home longer than the first man I mentioned. Doesn't make the situation, uh, the decision that the, the first wife makes a bad decision, it's the best decision for her and her husband. And the best decision for the second couple will be different. The timing will be different. So it's important to not um, uh, look at comparisons, you know, because it, that's easy to do. You know, aren't I a bad daughter? Because I'm looking to have my dad go into residential care, and my friend, she got her dad to come live with her. Um, and never mind that, you know, I live in a very small 
apartment, um, I have uh, low income, and I need to work, whereas my friend lives in a nice big house that has room for her dad. Um, they have a really comfortable income, so she doesn't need to worry if she has to cut back her hours at work. You know, the situation is, is different, and so um, it's a very easy situation to beat yourself up in, you know, to look at it and go, bad daughter, bad wife, bad, you know, niece, whatever. Um, but everybody's situation is very individual. So the right time, it's important to consider, obviously, the person with dementia. Are the care needs escalating? Are there safety issues? And, and everybody, too, has their, their line in the sand in terms of care. Some people are able to just roll with the punches. And when the person with dementia becomes incontinent, they're fine with that. You know, they, they clean them up. They have uh, incontinence briefs. And they're, they're able to manage that. Other people, it's like, once it reaches that point, I can't do it. I, just, I can't. And again, it's not a matter of one person's a great caregiver and the other one's a bad one. It's people are different. So for caregivers, what has to be taken into account is their stress and or health issues. Um, and again, people will be different in this regard. The decision is challenging for, for other reasons, too. And often, there's that tug of war between emotions and logic, where logic says, I know I can't do it. I'm tired. I'm sick. Um, I've got I've got to work, and I can't work and look at my husband, look after my husband at the same time. You know, all of those logical things. Fighting with the emotions. What kind of wife am I? What kind of daughter am I that I would do this? And and so there's that tug of war. Also, it's really hard to make any decisions, never mind life-altering decisions, when you're really tired, which as a caregiver, there's a pretty decent chance you will be at this point. You're exhausted, you're stressed, you're worried, you're sad, you're grieving. You're grieving the changes that are happening. You're grieving the future that you're not going to have with this person. The future will be different. And so there's so many emotions in here. And to, to sit down and make a really considered decision can be extremely challenging under those circumstances. Also, you may have made commitments to the person and commitments to yourself. So your mom may have said to you some years back, just promise me that if I get you know, really bad, you will never put me in one of those homes. And you say, Best of intentions, because you love your mom. No mom for sure. I will never do that. I promise you. Now you're at the point where you are so exhausted you can barely you know, write your name. Your mom's care needs are overwhelming. You can't do it a second longer. And not only are you beating yourself up because of the promise you made to her, you're beating yourself up because of the promise you made to yourself. Um, so if you are earlier in this process, please consider that before you make those promises. Saying something like, I promise I will look after you to the best of my ability, however that will be, Mom. I'll always be there for you. Those kind of promises probably are a little more doable than, I promise you, Scout's Honor, I will never put you in a home. Uh, that's a tough one. You don't know how things will change. Also, there's often judgmental comments from others. And that could be if it's your husband, your wife, that you're looking at residential care for. That might be your adult children. Now, Mom, it's not that bad. I was visiting last weekend, and Dad was OK. This is too early. Um, and they're not there 24-7. Or your siblings, if this is, is your uh, parent. You know, you have siblings that have different degrees of involvement. And it's often the siblings who have a lesser degree of involvement who are saying, you know, when I visited two months ago, she was OK. So I don't know why. You're just trying to get, you're just trying to get rid of mom. Um, and, and that can be really, really hard to work through for you. Uh, some families, when they're put in these situations, just get tight. You know, it's, it's a beautiful thing to see. Probably a lot more common is the exact opposite. 
different points of view, and the, the emotional investment is so strong that it can be a real challenge for people. So the decision is challenging because we're looking at what the person needs and what they're saying at that point that they want. Um, they may very well, if you're looking at facility care, they may very well be at the point where they don't have a clear understanding of, of their situation. They can't see that you are sick. They can't see that you're exhausted. There's that lack of empathy. They don't understand that this cannot continue. And they, they need more care than you can provide. And so there's that, that tug of war there as well. There can be a struggle to balance the allocation of family resources. So uh, there might, for example, be a private facility that everybody wants, but it's, well, gee, you know, dad's income is this. I wonder if, you know, if I threw in this much and if my brother threw in this much. And, and, and it can be um, difficult as well. It's also, it's, it's a role change. Um, whether you are the spouse, whether you're the adult child, you're making a really serious life decision for somebody else. And it's hard to do. It's very hard to do. And um, you know, we, we, you, we generally try to avoid doing that as much as possible. And then the pre-existing family dynamics. Um, for example, if um, you have two spouses, two spousal situations. One, the couple has had a long and happy marriage. They've been each other's best friends. The other one, it's been, you know, the husband's alcoholic. There's been a lot of fighting. It's been a, a real challenging um, relationship. That kind of decision making, um, there, there's, whole, there's a whole other series of dynamics that are involved. And it might be the kindest thing for the wife of the, the husband um, who's been alcoholic and the relationship has been, has been really not a good one. The kindest thing might be for that man to go into facility care sooner rather than later. Because then he will get care. She will very possibly be providing grudging care. And, and that's, that's not helpful for, to him or her. It helps to have a conversation about this as early as possible. Um, so even if there isn't dementia in the picture, if, if you've got a family member who's getting on in years, talk to them about the possibility. Um, but if, if the person already, you know they have dementia, as soon as possible. And, and having those conversations about, you know, I will do the best I can. I will do this as long as I can. But I always want you to have the best care and, and hoping to have that back and forth with the person while they're still able to. Ask permission to have the conversation, too. It's a hard conversation to have. Listen to their feelings. And those feelings will be all over the map. They will be anywhere from, listen, sweetheart, I don't want you to get sick looking after me. So if you have to do that, please do. All the way along to, don't you dare put me in one of those places. And, and, um, and the lucky people that are, are on the, the first part of the spectrum. Acknowledge their fears. You know, it's, um, it's a huge change for anybody. And it's good to have that talk. Now, when you're choosing a facility, work with the case manager. Um, check a few of the facilities in your area or your family member's area if it's, not, if it's not your area. Consider whether the facility is suitable for your family member and also for the family. So it might be a wonderful facility, but nobody in the family would be able to visit more than um, once every three months because it's so far away. You know, so you want to, to kind of factor in all of those things. Ask questions. Ask questions of the case manager. Ask questions of the facility when you're visiting. Um, they should be happy to field those questions. If they aren't, that might very well be a red flag. You can get a list of facilities from a health authority case manager. Your local health authority website also will have a list of facilities. And there's also facilities listed in a little booklet called the Care Guide. Now, you can often get these through the local Alzheimer's Society Resource Center, or you can get it online, or at least uh, get the Alzheimer's Society to order you one if you, um, if you don't go online. There's a booklet that, um, that the um, Department of Health has put out called 
So planning for your care needs help in selecting a residential care facility. And that can give you lots of good tips on what to look for when you're looking at various, at various places. Look at a few things. You know, often you walk in the front door and it's the, the, the physical layout that gets everybody. And if there's beautiful flowers and, you know, everything looks fresh and newly painted and, and pretty new, that can blind you to some of the other factors that are also important in care. So, you know, by all means, look at the location. What is the living space like? Is it pleasant? Does it seem dementia friendly? Um, so, for example, is there an inner courtyard where the person who has a tendency to, to pace, to wander, can go outside and enjoy the sunshine without, um, without any safety concerns? What's the resident to staff ratio? What kind of interaction do the staff have with, with the people who live in this facility? What kind of activities are offered? How are they with visiting? Are they, are they really accommodating when it comes to um, having families come to visit? What about safety? What's their care philosophy? Ask them very specifically, what do you believe when it comes to caring for the people in your care? How do you feel when you walk away from there? And often it's just that you might, you know, tick through several different things, but what's your gut telling you? Pay attention to that as well. Now when you're planning for the move, um, a few things you might want to get in order, and one is, if you or somebody else, and hopefully somebody does, have the legal authority to make health care decisions, a representation agreement, um, have those documents, um, have those available. Confirm medical services for the person. Make sure that you have a, a good idea of whatever your financial situation is. Think, have a look at, if you've chosen the, the facility, get a budget for the care expenses, including dates when things are payable, so you know that bills are going to go through okay. You're looking at address change notification for your family member. Talk to the facility about when's a good time to arrive. They may have a, an idea of a better time of day with the way their facility works. So they may say, for example, you know, the best time is 1.30, lunch is over, people are kind of mellow, it's not crazy busy, um, you know, depending on the facility. But do get their input on that. Find out who to contact on the day that you'll be going. What kind of personal items can you bring? And you certainly can bring personal items. Um, label them. They still might go missing sometimes, but do label them. Furniture, see what type of furniture. If you can do that ahead of time and move some of that furniture in ahead of time, so much the better. And so much the better if your family member's room can be set up before the move. So if that's possible, that's ideal. On moving day, have a strategy to minimize stress. Is there a specific staff member who can support the person during their first day? So that might be the care aid that, that is on their floor that can kind of take them in hand and introduce them to the lady next door and just make them feel welcome. Um, ask the person to introduce them to other staff and residents. Be prepared to sign documentation on healthcare decisions so that the facility knows uh, what types of things are okay or not. Also be prepared that you might not be the best person to bring your family member there that day. So for example, if you're the daughter, it's your mother who's going into care, and you are devastated that this has to happen. And every time you think of it, you burst into tears. And the day of the move, you've been crying all night long, and your eyes are puffy, and you're distraught you're probably not the best person to bring your mom on that day. Um, ask your neighbor. Ask uh, a close friend. Ask your brother. Ask somebody who can uh, put on their game face for your mom. So someone that can go, oh, this place is lovely. Let's go in here. Oh, this nice lady wants to take you for tea, mom. Somebody that can do that without bursting into tears because she will pick up on your emotions and you want to maximize the chances that she will feel good where she's moving. And um, your, your distress will be communicated loud and clear to her, and you don't want that. Help staff get to know your family member. There's a, a document available through Alzheimer Canada called All About Me. 
And it's, it's a good little booklet because it gives you a bit of a framework, you know, and what are my favorite foods and what time do I usually like to have a shower and what medication am I on, like all sorts of information about the person. And if you can fill out something like that beforehand, that gives some really good information to the staff. Let them know your family member's favorite foods, a bit about their personal history, photos. So, you know, here's a picture of the family. Likes and dislikes, what kind of thing typically calms the person? So you may have found through your caregiving over the last couple of years that um, opera music is wonderful to have on, on the CD player when your mom is distressed. Then let them know that. You know, music, hobbies, particular support needs. So, um, you know, she's able to dress herself and everything else. For some reason, she just has a really hard time brushing her teeth. Make all these things clear. And cultural issues. So, um, you know, if there are any cult specific cultural practices or beliefs, let the staff know that. Recognize that the person with dementia may experience increased disorientation when they're first moved to, to a facility. Sometimes when this happens, people are, again, beating themselves up. I made the wrong decision. I shouldn't, have, I shouldn't have done this. I should have tried harder. I should have kept her at home longer, all those kinds of things. In most cases, the increased disorientation will ease as they become more comfortable. In some cases, it won't. But the fact of the matter is you made this decision because you couldn't continue the way it was. And so sometimes you just have to accept that there is a change and you made the best decision you could at the time. The person with dementia might very well be quite fearful, um, feel lost. They might be angry. You know, you get me out of this place. I don't want to be in here. And sometimes it helps to, to pull back just a wee bit at first. In some cases, it's not at all necessary. They might need time to settle in. And so sometimes, depending on how the person's reacting, staff might say, you know what, maybe don't visit for a couple of days. Uh, just let them have a chance to meet people. Because the minute they see you, it's like you. You're the one who put me in here. Uh, so sometimes pulling back can help. And the caution is, you know, a lot of people will settle beautifully. A lot of people will settle far more uh, readily and, and well than the family ever expected it. But some don't, and this is a sad reality. Emotions for you, probably you'll feel guilty, whether you should or not, because you probably shouldn't. I, I think probably as in 99.9%, .9%, but you might very well feel guilty. This is my job. I'm the wife. I'm the daughter. I should be doing this. So there will probably be guilt sadness. You might feel very unsettled. If you have been the 24-7 caregiver, you go home after your husband moved to residential care, and you're sitting in this empty house with nothing to do. Um, you've, you've probably put your own needs on a shelf for so long that to go home and think of doing things for you um, is, is really, really difficult. So you might very feel, well feel very much at loose ends. You might feel relief. And sometimes when you feel relief, then go to number one. You feel guilty. Um, but that's absolutely natural. Oh, thank goodness. You know, dad's safe. I can have a good night's sleep for once because I'm not worried about him getting up in the middle of the night and, and wandering off. So, you know, don't feel guilty if you feel relief. That's absolutely natural. You might feel really angry. You know, that kind of raging at the gods kind of anger. Uh, this is what that stupid disease has done. You know, it's, it's robbed my husband and I of the future we had planned. And that might very well be one of the feelings. And there might be increased family tension, family conflict. Because, you know, you put mom in there. I didn't agree with you putting mom in there. Ah, da, 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 da. So that, you, that might escalate as well after this. Now, once the transition has happened, your job's not over. 
um, one of the men that we worked with some years ago, his wife went into care, and he said he realized, I'm still captain of the ship. I just need more crew. And if you can work with the staff in that, in that spirit, you will probably have a much happier experience of your family member being in care. You are a team working together for your family member. That's the ideal. Um, your decisions still matter. Your input still matters. They will probably call you to say, what do you do when your mom cries and you can't get her to stop crying? Because you're the one who knows her the most. Work together. Now that really is the, the, the quick lowdown on, on this whole um, transition to residential care. We do have, a, like I mentioned, a, a full workshop on this. We also have another workshop on life in residential care. And so that